I really want to thank everybody that subscribed to the channel. We've made it go over four and a half thousand subscribers already. I never expected that. We started with about 16 pounds of potatoes so that we'd have leftovers after we freeze dry the 10 pounds. Got a chance to get them nice and tender. Now we'll get them drained. Now I'm going to add some butter and then the other part of the potatoes. And use your favorite mashed potato recipe. Nothing special. So we'll add a bit of uh, milk to that and use the little hand mixer. Because to me, one of the important things of homemade mashed potatoes is that they should be slightly lumpy. I do not want them powdered and smooth because then I might as well just use powdered potatoes. I like mine to have some texture in them. Anyway, as soon as those are all done, they'll cool a little bit and then we'll get them into the trays or get them into the trays, the one pound trays, and then let them cool a bit. And then into the freezer for pre-freezing. And that's about it. So I'm gonna put the potatoes one pound in a pan. So on the divider pan, I'll have a half on each side. I'm going to give it a quick little spritz of the non-stick cooking spray. And same with the divider. Just a teeny little bit. Does not need much. And wipe it down. It just helps them pop out easier. Otherwise, it seems like on a lot of them I need to use, dip them in hot water or use a heat gun or something like that. So I got that zeroed out. And I'll just put, get eight ounces in each side. Let's see, make sure I've got it on the most sensitive one for a gram or for ounces. There we go. And then I'll use a little rubber spatula and kind of smooth them out. Okay, so now I'll smooth that out with a rubber spatula and that'll be ready to pre freeze and get ready for the freeze dryer. The other pans will just be. A uh, whole pound, one pound in the in the pan. So again, zero out the scale, and then just load it up to one pound. Yeah, pretty close. So then again, I'll s kind of smooth that down with the rubber spatula so that it's fairly even layer, so that it'll freeze dry pretty evenly. Get all the pans filled with that and get them in the freezer. And you can go directly onto the freeze dryer trays. You don't have to do the intermediate pan, but unless you own a lot of pans, uh, freeze dryer trays, you have to wait for them. And we often have many, many of these blocks in the freezer waiting for the freeze dryer to be empty. Okay, so uh, after they're frozen, we'll pop them out of these and put them in Ziplocs or directly on the tray, depending on timing. All right, so it's defrosted after the cottage cheese, and it's got a little about eight pounds of water here, which works out well because there was about two pounds of cottage cheese uh, left afterwards. It's had a chance to defrost. Uh, we'll make sure that everything's ready and get it set up for the next batch. So get the fan out of the door. And the little defrost baffle out. All right, and then I'm gonna use a little uh, paper towel on the little grabbers. They go in, make sure that any water spots are out or any uh, food particles. Almost never find anything unless things fall off the tray. There's a teeny little drop of water there. Okay, and I can see in each tray, they all look good. I'll go down along the sides. So just making sure that everything's taken care of. And underneath, Okay, 
and there was a little bit of water under there too. But everything looks good, looks pretty clean. And it should, just cleaned it. All right, so get the thermometer back underneath. Get the little disc into place, get it closed up, and we'll get it started and pre-cooling for the next batch. Right. So I'm starting it using custom, which is what I always use. You could just press start, and on the newer machines it probably makes more sense. So, and start, and continue. I've got the drain valve closed, but I see um, Missing a little bit of seal on this spot and here, so I'll just take my little pallet knife, give it just a little twist. And this might be completely, this might be completely unique to my machine. Maybe no other machine has this issue with not having a complete ring around there when it first starts. But I want to make sure I see that ring all the way around so that there's no air leaking in and out of, of this seal. And I want it that way before it starts vacuuming. I want it that way while it's cooling. All right, so let that cool for a half hour to an hour and then get the food in. It's been just over an hour since I started the machine. Uh, it's, mm, it's below zero now. We'll get the food in, starting with tray one. And the trays were in the freezer while the freeze dryer was defrosting. And this batch, is the mashed potatoes. Oh, let's put them over here. So these are the mashed potatoes from uh, a little while ago. I hadn't had time to de-pan these, so they've just been sitting in the freezer. And hopefully they'll come out easily, and that is. So that's one pound of mashed potatoes, and another pound of mashed potatoes, and then I've got the half pans, so a half pound on each side. There's a half pound of mashed potatoes. Okay, so tray one, 1876. And ideally, if they lost no weight while they were freezing, it would have been 1889. But they do lose weight while they're freezing. I mean, it's just how, like how you end up with freezer burn on your food in the freezer. Well, it's, it's losing some of the moisture. And especially since these went in when they were still slightly warm, it adds a lot of frost in the freezer, but oh well. Okay, and tray two. And tray three. So when I froze all of the rest of them in the pans with the divider. So I'll have lots of half ones in case I want to bag some with just a half a pound. So I don't always want to rehydrate a whole pound at a time. And of course you could have more in a bag and just measure out some and rehydrate that. But sometimes I just like a half uh, amount to start with, uh, like for lunch or something. Okay, and tray four. I want to get thermometers in these if I can. So I'm going to go for the second block back. And on these, maybe I'll Let's see, kind of go along here. I'll have to lift it up a little bit. I only need a, it to be in there about an inch. So and that's going to lift it up a little bit, but that's okay. And of course, again, thermometers are not required. I just like to see what the temperature is as it's going. It does kind of give me a heads up that it's getting close because uh, so, they can tell what the center of the food is instead of just where the temperature probe is in the machine. So now that's ready to go into the freeze dryer. So we'll get them over there. So it's been freezing for about an hour 20 minutes now. It's down to negative 10. Um, this will actually warm them up a bit because the food is warmer than the freeze dryer right now. So starting at the bottom with tray four. And work our way up. All right, 
get that. Let's check those. Yeah, they're all about 10 degrees right now. So nice and cold. It's still 20 degrees warmer than the freeze dryer because the freeze dryer is negative 10. All right, so I'll make sure that the seal ring is around it and it already is. So that's good. Uh, I've got a good seal. It's set to start in about four and a half hours. If it's if it's cold before that, I can start it ahead of time. And I'll be able to tell what the food temperature is by the thermometers. And sometimes it's considerably different than the machine's um, temperature probe. It, it depends a lot on the food. Uh, some of them freeze as quick as the, the machine shows it, and some of them take hours longer. All right, we'll be back and check it in a couple of days. The mashed potatoes are in the last few minutes of the final dry. I added three hours uh, last night because I knew I wouldn't be able to get to them in the morning before they finished. So I didn't want to have to have it stop and then restart for a short period of time. Usually if I let it stop overnight, it's because otherwise if it's running for six or eight hours uh, after it's already dry, it won't hurt anything as far as I know but it is running the vacuum pump unnecessarily so you've got wear and tear on it that's just not needed but anyway it doesn't really hurt anything as far as i know uh, but as a viewer pointed out or, or asked well, why not just add extra time and i need to remember to do that more often especially if it's only going to be two or three more hours uh, if it's going to be eight or ten hours yeah i might want to just let it stop and and just chill out uh, and then restart it to rewarm. But if it's only going to be two or three hours, add the time. So, and I need to remember to add on every video, I have an older machine. This one's from 2017. So the, and I did not update the firmware. I chose to stick with the one that came with it. I'm real happy with it. It gives me custom controls that don't seem to be available on some of the newer ones. The newer ones are more sophisticated software they're faster so i think it it sounds like a great machine uh, with a lot of improvements but i'm not going to update mine or buy a new one as long as this one still functions i mean our our newest vehicle is seven years old and we got bought it used uh, we'll run it until it dies same with this Hopefully it never dies. So we'll cancel out the rest of it, which only has a minute and a half. So let's get that done. So you can see it's in the last uh, minute or so. The pressure is really low. The temperature is up. Uh, the tray temperature is up. It's probably done, but I never chanced that. So let's get that. Okay. So open the drain valve. and we'll get the weights on them. Yeehaw! Okay, tray one. It's 9.88 now. So it's lost about 900 grams. So I'm going to rotate the trays top to bottom again. So I'll get a tray four. And 9.92 and then that one I'll put at the top and tray one I'll put at the bottom okay tray two okay 9.78 and tray three 9.73 Okay, and then this one will go, tray three will go up, and tray two will come down one. All right, so we'll get that reclosed. So, especially with the extra time, it's, it's almost definitely dry, but I'm never going to bag it without verifying. A very small amount of moisture left in it when you bag it will ruin everything in the bag. 
So I'm always going to double check. Even if I had one of the three or $4,000 water activity meters, I would still wonder if I happen to get, get the wrong spot on the tray. With all those trays combined, it's about 500 square inches of tray. Uh, the sample size for the meters are maybe a one inch area. Well, what if I miss the area that has the water in it still? So this way seems to be a decent method to accomplish it. It does take more time. It does take up more time in the machine. Um, and it probably costs more because now I'm going to run it for two more hours. I'm going to go with that. I think it's a simple method to ensure that I've gotten all the water out. I could be wrong. I'm a firm believer there's only one best way to do something right now. It just means maybe I haven't discovered the best way. This is the best way I know of right now. There could be a better way. It's closed. We'll get it restarted. Drain valve closed. Going to add more time. And I know I mentioned it at least once before. This little plastic shield is just something I use because it's a touch screen. Uh, that way if I see dust on the screen and go to wipe it off, I won't cancel a, a batch out in the middle of a batch. It has happened. So continue. Uh, drain valve is closed. The uh, vacuum pump is always cool because I've got the fan blowing on it. Okay, and I'm going to add 15 minutes to it so that I can get the full two hours before the heaters turn off. We'll be back in two hours. Um, it'll just be a few seconds for you. So two hours later, and it's time to check in on the mashed potatoes to see if they're dry. It turns out they weren't all the way dry and they needed more time. But what I couldn't do was remember to get the audio functioning properly. I had remembered to turn on the camera and I remembered to turn on the microphone, but I forgot to plug it into the camera this time. Anyway, so I don't have this. So we'll skip to the next time when we take it out to check it. Okay, it's a couple hours later, and it's in the last few minutes. The heaters are already off. I can take them out, check them to see if they're all the way dry. So I'm going to take them out real quick and check them, but I don't have time to bag them right now. So even if they are dry and ready to bag, I'm going to put them back in and let it run until I come back. Um, it won't hurt anything, but I want to check them now in case it's not done so I can get the weight right now and I'll know if there's any more weight drop. Uh, if there is, then it wasn't dry two hours ago. If there's no weight drop, that means it was dry two hours ago, and I can use that time for how long did it take to dry this batch. So let's get them out real quick, uh, get them weighed, and I can put them back in. So cancel out the rest of that. Or not cancel, but arrow down. I don't want to cancel it. So, opening the drain valve. Okay. So, tray one. Okay, tray two. Tray three. And tray four, 982. All right, so one tray went down by two and one went down by one. Okay, so since all, that's all it lost in two more hours, it's probably safe to bag it now. But since I don't have time to bag it right now and need to wait two more hours before I have time, I'll just let it run two more hours and then I'll take it out then. So I'm gonna add more time and close the drain valve. When I first started freeze drying, I thought it was kind of silly that it says close the drain valve. Now I'm really happy it says that because otherwise I would forget. Continue and go. Okay, and I'm going to uh, bump that up to three and a quarter hours so it can get up to three hours before the heaters turn off. I think I'll be back in two hours so I can take it out. 
but that way there's plenty of time just in case. So I bumped it up to three and a quarter hours. That way it can dry or have the heaters on for a full three hours um, before the heaters turn off and it starts to cool. However, I should be able to be back in less than two hours and then I can always shorten that cycle again. But I'd rather have it longer and not stop. Okay, we'll be back in a couple hours. Don't go away, we'll be right back. I'm back and it's in the last few minutes again. So there should be no doubt about it being dry this time. Uh, it's been three additional hours and one tray was only part of one gram last time and one tray was about two grams last time. But I didn't have time to bag them anyway, so there was no reason not to put them back in. So this time we should be able to take them out and get them ready to bag. Okay, so we're gonna arrow down past the last of it. And I'm still leaving it run just in case I'm wrong and they aren't finished yet. Get the drain valve open. And the one I really want to know about is tray four. So I'm going to go right for tray four. Wow, that actually dropped a lot. Oh, sheesh. No, it didn't. I was looking at the wrong number. Yikes. Okay. So in th three hours, so it's bouncing. So in three hours, it's gone down maybe a part of a gram, a half a gram or something. So it was so close before, I don't think we have a problem now. So let's double check the other trays. So tray three. Okay, still no change. Tray two. Also no change. And tray one. Okay, we're good. So I'm gonna go ahead and put no defrost. And then I'm gonna put the defrost fan in the door and a little baffle piece. Get that defrosting. Now get the mashed potatoes rolled over to the bagging area. So we'll get the time and for the time I'm gonna use three hours less than it's showing on the display because the last three hours it didn't seem to drop any so it was dry three hours ago but I need to do other other things so we'll count that as the final time so that was 43 hours 15 minutes the power usage for the mashed potatoes was 30.19 kilowatt hours so I'll get that reset and ready for the next batch okay tray one so first, we'll get all the gross weights now with the thermometers out and then check to find out what the final weight of the mashed potatoes are. And then we can calculate out how much it is per pound now. So tray one, 973 grams. And my plan is to bag it in one pound amounts. I think that should fit in a quart bag. If it doesn't, then we'll probably uh, bag it in three quarters of a pound. Anyway, so I've got one pound units and half pound units. So tray two, tray three, so I'll calculate out the current weights and we'll be right back. Don't go away. The mashed potatoes are done now and ready to bag. Uh, they weigh about two pounds now and they started out as 10 pounds. I'm hoping to put one pound in each one of the quart bags. And you definitely could put a lot more in a two quart bag or whatever, and then just scoop out what you need. But I really like just being able to use a bag at a time. If you're going to open something and use it in a relatively short time, there's no reason you can't use a bigger bag. This is just what we kind of found works for us after a period of time. We freeze dried them in half pound blocks and one pound blocks so that they're already weighed out. I don't have to weigh them as I bag them. I know what they are to start with. The reason we use the little pans to pre-freeze them is that way we can portion them out ahead of time. And then that makes it quick and easy when we go to use them. 
You could put them without freezing into the uh, freeze dryer without pre-freezing. I like to pre-freeze most everything. And part of the reason is we usually get way ahead. When we're cooking big batches, we'll end up with a bunch of them in the freezer ready for freeze drying. Sometimes we might have a hundred or more of these blocks in the freezer waiting their turn. So you could have extra freeze dryer trays, but for us that might mean having uh, 10 extra sets, 15 extra sets. They'd be pretty expensive in comparison to these dollar store pans. Uh, some of these pans we've had for 10 years or more, we, we just keep using them. Anyway, they're cheap. It works for us. There's a lot of ways you could go about that. Okay, so let's get them bagged and moved over. So we've got some bags pre-labeled. Uh, I've got what batch number it is, what it is, the date that it went into the freeze dryer, and how much water it needs. And we'll fill this in as soon as we find out if a pound will actually fit. And then finish filling out all the bags. So we'll try uh, one of the bags, putting one full pound in, see if it fits. It probably will. So I want to get one pound at a time, so I want to take some of them out of this tray. So let's see if they'll stay together or if it's just going to come apart. Okay, they feel pretty fragile. All right, so that'll let me work with one pound. So my plan is to crumble them up a bit. So even after weighing them to make sure they're dry, if I ever came across a wet spot or even a cool spot, since I take them out while they're warm, I would dump everything back on the tray and put them back in for additional time. Since I've been putting them back in for additional time and weighing them, that's never happened again. All right, so one pound fits in there fairly easily. You could use a food processor or a blender or something to powder them up. So this is what I do for milk and eggs and things. So I'm going to go ahead and try that with these potatoes. They're more solid than milk is or, or eggs. But I think they'll still crunch up pretty well. And then I can just pour them into the freeze dryer bag. Or the oh yeah I like that I like that better okay so that's what I'm gonna do with them I don't know why I did it the other way okay so first I want to get the weight on this so one pound I'll finish labeling all the bags so Add the fact that it's one pound and it needs 366 grams of water to get it back to level as it was before. So I'll mark all the bags and we'll be back and finish these. All the bags are labeled. I'm going to pour the potatoes in. All right, they're all in there, nice and tidy. You could use a food processor or something else, but it really doesn't need it. I mean, it just takes a, a quick squish and it's done powdered well enough to uh, make it work. And the potatoes aren't near as powdery as the milk was, so it's not flying up and all staticky. By carefully tracking the weights of the potatoes before and after the freeze drying, I know that what was one pound now weighs about 88 grams and has lost 366 grams of water. So to get it back to the way it was, I just need to add about 366 grams back in. Your mashed potatoes will probably be different. If you make your mashed potatoes wetter, they're going to lose more water, and to get them back to the same, you'll have to add more water. If you make yours drier, the opposite way around. So all of them are bagged now, and we've got one pound in each. I think in the quart bag, you could easily comfortably get a pound and a half in each one, which would be about three cups of potatoes. 
I'm going to add a 300 cc oxygen absorber to each one of these and kind of squish out as much extra air as I can. Get them zippered shut and then heat seal them. And that's another reason I like to do 10 bags in a batch if I can because these oxygen absorbers come bagged in tens. Then I don't have to have any spares or reseal any. But I don't really worry about it too much. I just move fast to get them resealed. So I'm going to tuck them down alongside. Though these are not terribly full, so it's not a real big concern. I could probably just toss them in on the top because it's down in a couple of inches. And I'm going to very carefully, since it's powder, to not make any of it fly out of there. Just squish out any extra air and get them sealed. So you can see the top of it's kind of flat, so I squished out that much air. And just do that to all of them, and then move on to the seal. And of course you could vacuum, uh, use a vacuum sealer, uh, like one of the vacuum chamber types or some other type. Now, time to seal them. So I know there's a variety of different kinds of sealers. So I have this strip heater type. It's an impact brand. Uh, this is what they were shipping from Harvest Right when I got mine. And I've been real happy with it. So make sure that the bag is smooth and no wrinkles in it. Um, got it at the top edge. So. And the first bag, again, I like to do twice to make sure that it's nice and toasty because there's a lot of metal under there to cool it off. And I don't have the temperature all the way up. I have it around a six and a half maybe. All right, so good seal. So I find if I have it high enough to seal that first one instantly with one seal, then the subsequent bags, it's kind of overheating and getting kind of melty. So, just make sure they're smooth and get them done. Then I let it sit for just a couple of seconds before I release it. And it really would be easier if you had tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of bags to close instead of just 10 bags, because then you could afford automated equipment bag fillers, nitrogen flush machine, automatic sealer, the whole thing. With all the bags sealed, I'm going to add one more step before I put them in the bins for storage. I'm going to add a gross weight to each bag, so 113 grams. That way, if I'll know if this bag fails and starts letting moisture in, a uh, bad seal, bad bag, whatever, I'll be able to tell right away by just putting it on the scale. And if the weight's going up, then I know that there's a problem. As soon as I have all these labeled, we'll move over to the bins. The mashed potatoes are bagged and ready to store. They're going in bin 5 with the other things from bin 5. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we're going to end up with extra space in bin 5 because it's only about halfway full right now and we just have two more things to go for the six categories. Uh, this, the, so the mashed potatoes, and the next thing is also potatoes. It's scallop potatoes. thought it made sense to go with two potato dishes in a row for kind of for economies of scale. Then we could just buy a bigger bag of potatoes and do two things at once get started on potatoes and work on potatoes. The other thing I wanted to mention is the parchment paper. When I do two things in a row that are essentially the same, like two batches of vegetable, you know, frozen vegetables, or in this case, two batches of potatoes, I'll often just reuse that parchment as long as it looks really clean. I'll wipe it down with a dry paper towel and save it for the next batch, or leave it on the freeze dryer trays and put it in the freezer while I'm waiting for the freeze dryer to defrost. And as soon as it's defrosted, we'll get the next batch in there. Again, scalloped potatoes. We'll get the mashed potatoes in the bin and get ready to move on to the next thing. Okay. 
All right, so the last thing that went in is the cottage cheese and and the oxygen absorbers have done their magic and sucked those down a bit. And now we'll go ahead and get the mashed potatoes in there. Definitely have room for the next batch. And those bags might be a little bigger, so it's not going to have that much extra space in here. Um, if it has extra space, we'll note it in case we need the extra space for some other bag on a, on a later batch. All right, that's it for those. Well, we're doing mashed potatoes. I thought I could show the mashed potatoes from previous batch and maybe even rehydrate a few. So this is the racks of the previous uh, batches. This is our bin racking and it's two layers deep. So this is four front and behind that is four back. So that's how we decided to label them um, and partially because we needed to start some way. It turns out, I mean, we could have just labeled them one through 40. That's what we have so far and then just added more afterwards. The uh, main thing I wanted to be able to do is know at a glance from our computerized list if it's in the front row or in the back row. That's why we did the fronts and back. So space four, front and back. The potatoes are in uh, nine back. Under potatoes we have and these are things that we've made, not necessarily things we still have, because we may have made a, f a smaller amount and then used them up at some point. At some point, and some of these things on the list are things that we have freeze dried, but we didn't make. Somebody else made them, and we freeze dried it for them. Potato soup, uh, diced and boiled yellow, red, and russet potato mix. So those are things that we don't currently have. We have some french fries in one of the bins, and then mashed potatoes. We have 12 bags from that date in that bin, and two more from another date, and one more from another date. Okay, so... Okay, so this is the newest one. And the bigger bag, that looks like probably, okay. okay, that's one of the oldest bags. So we have 12 older bags and some of them are in the bigger two quart bags and it's a much bigger amount of potato. So, and I certainly don't want that many of them right now. So I'm going to look to see if I have an older date of a small bag. Ah, there we go. So that's the same older date as that one in a smaller bag. Okay, so I could get that one out. And then I have to mark it off on my list so the computer file can be updated on that. Uh, mixing up a little sample of mashed potatoes. It's about two cups and it should be a total of 440 grams. Unfortunately, on some of the early bags, I didn't put exactly how much needed to be added uh, just have the totals. So then I put it on the scale and I just keep adding until I'm that amount. But with water things, sometimes that's not the best plan because you could easily pour too much. So anyway, I'm going to put this on the scale, find out what it weighs, uh, subtract the difference so I'll know how much water it needs to be, and then weigh that out separately. And I'll add boiling water. Okay, so I'll get that open. And this one's just from a couple years ago. Okay. Get the oxygen absorber out. All the nice fluffy white potatoes. Uh, 
All right, so it's 90 grams. So I need 350 grams to, of water to go with that. So take the scale, I'll weigh out 350 grams, get it boiling, and then add to it. And I probably, hmm, I probably want to add this to the, the water, not the water to this, because otherwise I'll end up with dry spots at the bottom probably. So I'll get the water, 350. All right, so I have 350 grams of boiling water. And I'll add the potatoes in as quick as I can. Boy, this is a bad plan. Um, that's ridiculous. So I'm going to put it back in the bag. Yeah, that'd be easier to pour it. All right, so now back in the bag because it's easier to pour it into there because then I can kind of use that like a funnel. it up real quick and then I'm going to cover it and let it set for a couple of minutes so they get rid of the dry spots all right let's check that out it's been a couple minutes All right, the consistency is correct. And I think when you do instant, regular instant mashed potatoes, store-bought instant mashed potatoes, I think you let them sit for like five minutes. So this might be a little short on these, but it looks good. Tastes perfect. And they're homemade mashed potatoes instead of the instant powdered stuff, which is so smooth and powdery. I, I like mine to have a little bit of texture, and so these do because they were never powdered that fine. The consistency is perfect. It only takes a couple of minutes. Really worked out well. And probably even better than KFC mashed potatoes. That's it for the mashed potatoes. And of course, if you want yours mashed potatoes much smoother, two things. One, you could just simply mix them more or mash them more. And two, you're wrong. There's no point in having homemade mashed potatoes that don't have texture to them.